So we have two panels today, as you know, uh, the first on domestic litigation of international human rights norms and the second on documentation of human rights abuses, which um, is a useful skill for anyone um, working in, in the human rights field, but also in other you know, non-international related areas of civil rights and social justice work. Um, but this morning, we're gonna cover a lot of ground. <laughs> um, it will be, I am, quite sure very interesting. It's a very timely discussion, as many of you uh, no doubt already know. But let me introduce our first four panelists. Uh, we'll be starting with uh, Shimen Keitner, who is a professor here at UC Hastings and has extensive experience in a variety of areas of international uh, public litigation, both representing plaintiffs and intervening uh, as an amicus, um, in an amicus capacity in cases in the United States. So she'll provide sort of an overview of those areas of litigation. Then we will hear from Kathy Roberts, the legal director of the Center for Justice and Accountability. I know many of you are already familiar with CJA. They're based here and their focus is on um, litigation under the Alien Tort Statute and the Torture Victims Protection Act, which you will hear all about from Kathy, who uh, has a wealth of experience to share with us as well. Uh, to her left is Naomi Rote Ariaza, also a professor here at Hastings, um, really well known, <laughs> I think, throughout the world for her contributions um, to this this field, this study of um, public international um, law, to prosecutions for massive um, violations of of human rights and of international humanitarian law. She's written widely on those topics and uh, the phenomenon of um, transitional justice. Uh, to her left is Karen Masalo, who many of you already know, um, again, directs the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies here at Hastings and is truly a pioneer in the fields of asylum law, particularly with regard to the rights of um, women. So um, please join me in welcoming these panelists and I look forward to what they have to say. Um, all right, well, thanks so much, Lisa, to you for um, bringing us all together here, and um, I'm especially looking forward to time at the end for dialogue with all of you, um, because I know that you um, all bring really interesting experiences at, and insights to bear on this area as well, so we definitely are planning to save um, a good 15 minutes at the end for, for all of you to save up your questions and, uh, and engage in a dialogue. Um, during the session and then certainly you can grab any of us afterwards or email us um, if you have further questions. Because as Lisa mentioned, um, our task is a somewhat daunting one. It's really to give an overview of ways in which uh, international norms are deployed in domestic litigation, uh, primarily, although not exclusively, in U.S. domestic courts. Uh, and so uh, I fear at the outset <laughs> that we're going to whet your appetites, but maybe not satisfy them. Um, but, but in that regard, um, I do welcome you, uh, at least speaking for myself, to, to follow up individually with any um, issues that I mentioned in this very brief overview that I'm about to give that you'd like um, more references or details about. I'm, I'm more than happy to provide those um, to you. So um, in sort of stepping back and thinking about this, uh, you know, I'm going to sort of give, as I said, a, a bit of an overview. Kathy will then um, elaborate on that. Um, she both practices and teaches, uh, but to talk a little bit more, I think, in depth about some of the cases that she's handled recently. Uh, Naomi's going to fill in a little bit on the criminal law side of things. So while Kathy and I will focus primarily on civil litigation, um, we want to definitely expose you to uh, some of the, the uh, activity on the criminal law front. And then Karen, of course, uh, I can't think of anyone better to, to talk about the immigration and asylum uh, aspects of the ways in which international norms come into domestic decision making. And it's, uh, I think, it's delightful to have that as part of this conversation because so often the sort of litigation conversation and the immigration conversation happen uh, very separately. And so I think it's great to try to tie those together. Um, so understanding that, that all of you are coming from sort of different backgrounds, some of this may be uh, familiar to you, some of it not. But stepping back, my assumption is the overarching question is, you know, what are the ways in which uh, reference to international law can advance the interests of our clients or your clients. And um, the answer is uh, there are many ways in which uh, I think international law can be deployed, although a cautionary note is that at least in recent years, 
uh, the success of attempts to deploy international law has certainly been mixed. And so unfortunately, uh, I understand that yesterday uh, the, the overarching mood was not necessarily one of optimism. <laughs> and I'm afraid I'm not going to do anything to, to alter that. Um, but that said, I think you know, if, if one were to sort of take a glass half full approach, um, the fact that more and more advocates are using and deploying international law arguments means that international law and international norms um, are becoming part of the fabric of the sort of civil and human rights discourse uh, that we use in this country. Uh, it has been for many years in other countries as well. And, and by the way, of course, not to say that it's a new phenomenon in the United States at all. In fact, you know, back in the uh, late 18th century, pretty much every argument made to the U.S. Supreme Court was an international law argument. So, in fact, we've got quite a, a pedigree for these kinds of arguments. Um, but particularly looking in the last few decades with, with the human rights movement, I think that the integration of domestic and international law um, is something that, that is to be um, noted and I think is, is definitely a positive development. However, with any sort of development like that, there's also been a backlash, and I'll, I'll say a few words about that as well. Um, so there are sort of primarily two ways, I think, in civil litigation uh, that international law could help advance client interests, right? One is by providing the basis for a claim or cause of action in litigation. Uh, and then the other is by informing or giving content to uh, existing domestic norms or causes of action, right? Um, so, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about both of those. I would say that generally speaking, uh, using international law, and, and I'll get into this in a little bit more detail in a minute, um, for example, a treaty obligation and attempting to use that as a direct basis for a cause of action has proved uh, difficult. All right, so attempts have certainly been made. I'll mention a couple of contexts in a minute. Um, but the, the uh, attempt to resort directly to international law to supply a cause of action in a U.S. court um, ha has been um, uh, not the most fruitful exercise. However, um, using international law to inform domestic causes of action, I think, has gained uh, somewhat greater success, um, not only uh, or not necessarily in terms of manifesting itself in, say, written opinions that necessarily reference international law, although there have been a few of those, but I think in providing a context for judges to understand that they are part of a sort of global community of decision makers who are interpreting norms such as, for example, um, you know, freedom, liberty, dignity, some of these more amorphous notions. Uh, and in that regard, I think we've seen a, a number of um, organizations, the ACLU among them, uh, Human Rights First, Human Rights Watch, CJA for sure, that have been supplying amicus briefs to courts to help situate uh, to help judges situate their decision making in the context of evolving global norms, right? And so again, even though you might not see references to those briefs directly in the written opinions, I think there is an attempt to educate and inform judges uh, about the sort of trends, uh, particularly in uh, Western democracies that would lend support to uh, a particular resolution of a case. These amicus briefs, I think, are important because judges are, by and large, unfamiliar with international law, right? So unless uh, you educate them, uh, they're really not going to have a lot to go on. And I think that is something that, um, as educators, we're trying to remedy, <laughs> slowly but surely. Um, but it's something to be cognizant of that, you know, uh, and, and Paul Hoffman, of course, who's litigated a lot of these cases, will tell, uh, you know, a distressing but colorful stories about the kinds of looks he's received in courtrooms from judges when he mentioned is the word international law, right? And I'm sure some of you have had that experience, or if you haven't, uh, it, it may lie ahead of you. So um, there, there are a number of organizational efforts underway to try to better educate judges about international law. Uh, the American Society of International Law has put together a bench book on international law for judges. Uh, many judges will resort to the uh, American Law Institute's Restatement of Foreign Relations Law as a source of information on international law issues. Uh, the current version of that restatement uh, is somewhat out of date. It's a 1987 or so version. Uh, the ALI is now in the process of updating that restatement. Um, but just understand, right, that when you say international law, judges will wonder. If you haven't encountered this phenomenon already, you will. Um, well, what does that have to do with my decision making here in a U.S. courtroom? Uh, and in fact, uh, as many of you know, there have been a number of state law initiatives lately um, specifically geared towards barring judges from considering either foreign, i.e. Uh, another country's domestic law, or international law 
in their decision making. And so the backlash I mentioned earlier is happening um, on the political front. And so I think that it is extremely important for all of us as educators, advocates and whatnot um, to remind judges that international law is a body of law like any other um, and that it does interpenetrate uh, what goes on uh, in the United States as it does elsewhere. Um, so the, the three kinds of actions I want to focus on in the balance of my remarks, uh, are I've divided them up according to who one might sue, since we're in a domestic litigation context, uh, for an international law violation um, or a violation whose parameters are informed by international law, even if international law doesn't supply the cause of action directly. Uh, and broadly speaking, right, as you can imagine, uh, the categories would be US government actors, foreign government actors, and then private actors of a variety of types, uh, including both individuals and corporations. So starting with US government actors, um, and one could name a variety of kinds of cases, but I'll focus on two in the interest of time. Uh, the first are the so-called uh, war on terrorism cases, right? Um, and I think a classic example of this is a case that I was involved in uh, early on, uh, Ali versus Rumsfeld. So this is a case brought on behalf of four uh, Afghan and four Iraqi uh, detainees uh, who allege torture and various other abuses uh, in US-run detention facilities in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, uh, as you can imagine, right, there are a number of legal hurdles uh, to bringing this claim on their behalf, uh, all of which ultimately proved insurmountable. <laughs> um, but they still, uh, it gives you an illustration, right, of the types of claims that you could think about uh, when a client has suffered harm at the hands of a US government actor. Um, in particular, uh, in this case, because the harms all occurred overseas, there was an even bigger hurdle to, to surmount, right? Uh, in particular, any of you who've done litigation under the uh, Federal Tort Claims Act will know that there's a foreign country exception under the Federal Tort Claims Act. So under that statute, um, harms arising overseas aren't covered. Uh, there was also an attempt to bring uh, a Bivens claim for violation of constitutional rights. And those of you who do uh, Bivens litigation will know that uh, defendants are entitled to qualified immunity if the violation was not clearly established at the time of the act. Now, interestingly, in the decisions uh, in Ali versus Rumsfeld, uh, the judges were quite, quite uh, willing to acknowledge that torture is a clearly established violation of just about any body of law you can imagine. Um, however, what they found was not clearly established was the, uh, the fact that the, con the US Constitution, which of course provides the basis for a Bivens claim, extends overseas. Right, um, and so I think when you're litigating harms, and I, I, Kathy will I'm sure speak more to this, that have occurred overseas, right, the, the geographic scope of uh, whatever body of law it is you're seeking to invoke is, is gonna be extremely important. And although uh, recent US Supreme Court decisions, uh, in particular the Boumediene case from a number of years back, have started to make inroads into this notion that the US Constitution doesn't apply overseas to aliens, um, there's certainly very small inroads, right? And, and at the moment, um, we pretty much know that at least the right of habeas applies to Guantanamo Bay, uh, but that is not necessarily uh, generalizable and in fact has, has, by the lower courts, not been found to apply to other, for example, US run detention facilities. Uh, so I think that the primary value of the Ali versus Rumsfeld case uh, was didactic, right? It certainly, uh, I think, in tandem with uh, the Freedom of Information Act litigation that was going on at the same time helped bring the abuses uh, in Afghanistan and Iraqi detention facilities to light. Uh, I think that um, it also, right, had the paradoxical effect of revealing the roadblocks to this kind of litigation. Um, Elizabeth Wilson uh, at Seton Hall has written a couple of articles on uh, this type of litigation and the, and the roadblocks to that, so you might look at her work if you're interested in some of the details. Um, and it, it also, I think, um, underscores a theme that, that will surface in the rest of my remarks, which is that the um, best avenue to remedies in these cases, really in my view is legislative change, right? Is creating explicit uh, causes of action that are sort of clearly delineated um, upon which litigants can rely. Because uh, in these sort of 
uh, more common law, sort of judge-made law areas, we're seeing a reticence of judges largely to override uh, political decision-making and assert their authority to grant remedies. Um, the, the other U.S. government actor category of case I just wanted to mention briefly are a number of cases that um, you may be familiar with involving the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. Um, so as you may know, under this international treaty, the United States has an obligation to notify foreign nationals who are arrested in the United States of their right to contact a consular official from their home country. Uh, and uh, again, sort of fast forwarding, I think that the end result of a lot of this litigation has been some greater, not perfect, but some greater education of state and local law enforcement officials that they actually need to comply with this obligation, right? Um, but the way in which these, uh, this Vienna Convention obligation became a basis for litigation was as a collateral attack on a number of um, death sentences that had been imposed on foreign nationals arrested and convicted in the United States for crimes committed here. Um, and now in some of the lower court decisions, interestingly, and there were, was sort of a circuit split, um, some of the lower courts thought that this Vienna Convention, this international treaty, actually did provide a cause of action in a US court uh, for failure to notify because the language of that particular treaty provision seemed to convey essentially an individual right uh, on the arrested foreign national. Uh, other courts were much more hesitant to go that far. And uh, in the uh, recent Medellin decision in the US Supreme Court in which the US Supreme Court was asked essentially to implement a decision of the International Court of Justice about this provision, uh, a majority of the US Supreme Court said, well, you know, um, that, that goes beyond essentially what the treaty requires us to do. Um, so these Vienna Convention cases I think are interesting, um, but as they've played themselves out, I think they reinforce the, the point I made earlier, which is that uh, treaty obligations I think are very important to educate judges about, but they're not something that you're likely to be able to persuade a judge to implement directly as the basis for a cause of action uh, in civil litigation. Uh, turning to suits against foreign government actors, uh, which is sort of Kathy's expertise, um, as, as Kathy will mention, the two uh, statutes under which most of this domestic civil litigation against foreign government actors has proceeded um, are the uh, Torture Victim Protection Act, which is 1990s legislation enacted um, pursuant to the United States' ratification of the Convention Against Torture. So again, here we've got an international treaty, Convention Against Torture, but importantly, what's providing the cause of action is not the treaty itself, but rather what we call the implementing legislation, right? The act that Congress has actually passed, uh, which is a much more solid basis for proceeding in a US court. Um, then uh, we have the infamous Alien Tort Statute, right, which predates the Torture Victim Protection Act by about two centuries. Uh, this mysterious 1789 statute uh, that was the subject of the Supreme Court's recent decision in, in Kiobel versus Royal Dutch Petroleum that we're happy to elaborate on more in questions. Um, the other some, some, somewhat um, or sometimes overlooked basis for suits against foreign governments, I think, in US courts. Uh, and I'll try to say this slowly because <laughs> it's a mouthful, is the state sponsors of terrorism exception to the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. So the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act basically says you can't sue a foreign state for its public activities. Uh, and in a case called Saudi Arabia versus Nelson, public activities under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act include things like torture, right? Um, so you can't sue the state itself. Uh, however, um, under this state sponsors of terrorism exception, you can sue certain designated state sponsors of terrorism and individuals who act on their behalf. So uh, there's actually a whole cottage industry of um, civil litigation against state sponsors of terrorism. And although the collection uh, efforts to, uh, on those judgments um, have had mixed success, they are some of the few cases against foreign states that have actually gone through to judgment. Um, so that is something I think to be aware of and that more and more um, people are eyeing as, uh, a, again, a way of finding a solid domestic legislative basis for bringing an action in a US court. Um, the two issues that, that have arisen in, in TVPA and ATS cases, um, among many, uh, are, first of all, the question of, you know, the scope of the jurisdiction granted by these statutes. Uh, in the TVPA, the reason I'm um, talking about this under the suits against foreign government actors part of my remarks 
is because it specifically gives a cause of action for torture under color of foreign law, right? <laughs> so it doesn't help you if you're trying to sue uh, a US official. Uh, the alien tort statute, by contrast, does not specify or discriminate with respect to defendants, but as its name suggests, requires that the plaintiff be uh, an alien. Uh, and so these are um, complementary but, but somewhat uh, ill-fitting provisions, uh, and particularly with respect to the alien tort statute, although in theory it's much broader, because it doesn't specify torture only, right, and the TVPA is for torture and extrajudicial killing, um, as many of you know, there's been a lot of litigation about, well, what exactly does it encompass? Uh, and in particular, most recently, uh, the question has arisen, does it encompass suits against uh, private actors, including corporations? And does it encompass, most uh, problematically, as it had been assumed to encompass uh, for many years, does it encompass harms arising overseas, right? Or is this just something designed to remedy uh, harms occurring in the United States? Um, so the interest of time, moving on to private actors. Um, private actors certainly can be sued in these types of cases. Uh, the uh, Second Circuit's decision in a case against Radovan Karadich uh, established that proposition, uh, at least in certain circumstances. Uh, there have also been a number of cases brought um, for aiding and abetting international law violations, right? So the primary tort fees would be a foreign government, but a private actor or corporation would aid and abet uh, that activity. Um, the tricky thing, as I said, it particularly after Kiobel, is um, the United States Supreme Court has uh, very recently said that an action arising under the alien tort statute, um, or that rather the alien tort statute itself, is subject to the, what's called the presumption against extraterritoriality, right? So in other words, unless there is, um, and here's the, the operative language, right? Um, unless the claims uh, touch and concern the territory of the United States, with sufficient force to displace the presumption against extraterritorial application, uh, they, there, there will not be subject matter jurisdiction in a US court, right? So the, the scramble now that Kathy, I think, will, will tell us about is to figure out or to persuade judges that a particular case touches and concerns the territory of the United States with sufficient force to displace the presumption against extraterritorial application. Um, now, the good news, perhaps, coming out of this is the Supreme Court has left open the possibility that corporations could be defendants in these cases. Um, so that, that question is still live. Under the TVPA, the Torture Victim Protection Act, corporations cannot be defendants, only natural persons can. So the ATS is really the place to go if your defendant uh, is a non-natural person. Um, however, right, we've got this language now that, that's been the focus of um, a, basically an avalanche of, um, uh, of briefing in a variety of outstanding cases that have been brought under the Alien Tort Statute. Um, and so the last observation I want to make, which is maybe um, you know, one for all of us to reflect upon, and having sat in on some of the uh, proceedings in Boato versus Chevron, which is an Alien Tort case uh, litigated here in Judge Susan Olston's courtroom, down the street, uh, under the alien tort statute, by definition, you've got a foreign plaintiff, right? Often one who has sought and received asylum in the United States, but a foreign plaintiff nonetheless. Generally speaking, um, actions that have occurred overseas, although there have been a couple of successful alien tort suits for actions in the United States, um, but by and large, they're, they're foreign activities. And now with this additional um, presumption added on, the successful cases are bound to be ones where you have either US domiciled or at least you know, extremely uh, Americanized <laughs> defendant of some sort. Uh, and the way that cases like that play to a jury, <laughs> right, um, I think is something that's really important for advocates to keep in mind. Because as compelling as the narrative may be, um, when you've got literally a foreign plaintiff, and when your defendant, I mean, if you've got a sort of um, extremely unsympathetic, you know, Enron type defendant, then you might be in luck. Uh, but if you've got a sort of middle manager who's saying, you know, I did the best I can, I was thrown into this situation in the middle of a foreign country and I'm just trying to protect my guys, <laughs> right? Um, some of the claims that, that may seem to resonate so much to a civil rights lawyer or human rights advocate um, who's got the victim sitting in his or her office telling about the horrible things that happened um, is just going to look different by the time it gets to a jury with skilled defense lawyers uh, crafting the narrative as well. And so I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, and so the final, the final point being keeping in mind the optics of these cases in terms of their potential success, uh, and then looking as much for 
uh, domestic legislative provisions under which to bring them. And if those provisions don't exist, to encourage us all to put, channel our efforts into helping to create them. Thanks. I'm so pleased to be here. I really want to thank Lisa as she walks out the door um, and the International Justice Resource Center um, for the opportunity to speak with all of you. I'm really excited to be here and thrilled to be on a panel with Shimen and Naomi and Karen, who are all luminaries, I'm sure you know. Um, so my name is Kathy Roberts. I am the legal director at the Center for Justice and Accountability. Um, and as Lisa mentioned, our sort of core work is litigation under the Alien Tort Statute and the Torture Victim Protection Act. Uh, we are a human rights organization that is dedicated to deterring torture and uh, representing um, the victims um, so that they have access to justice and redress and, and to the truth. And um, because we've been doing this work for some time, we actually also work in other countries. So we've been working on it, the Alien Tort Statute and the Torture Victim Protection Act. Our attorneys also represent victims in criminal proceedings in Spain and in Cambodia, and we support litigation in other countries. Most recently, you might have heard about what's happening in Guatemala. I'm not gonna talk about any of that. I've been asked to talk about the ATS and the TVPA, and that's what I will do, um, but just so you know that we have that sort of context. One of the key pieces of our work is to hold individuals accountable. So where Shimen was talking about cases against corporations, um, we don't bring those cases. We are really focused on um, individuals, indi na individual natural persons um, who are responsible for serious human rights crimes. Um, if we're gonna sue them in the United States, it's because we found them in the United States. Um, but, but we're really part of this global movement um, for justice, sometimes called the universal jurisdiction movement. Um, it's the idea that there are certain crimes that are so heinous that the perpetrators should be tried or held accountable in some way wherever they can be found. Or I should say universal jurisdiction usually means tried, it means criminal. Um, what we practice here in uh, the United States under the Alien Tort Statute or the Torture Victim Protection Act is kind of a cousin of universal jurisdiction. Um, it's universal civil jurisdiction, Maybe it's not quite universal, um, especially after Kiobo. Um, but the idea is, is we're kind of from a formal perspective doing car crash cases. These are tort cases, personal injury cases. Um, if you remember back to your torts class, many of the elements are the same. So sort of from a formal perspective, obviously from a substantive perspective, they're quite different and we have all kinds of additional issues. Um, I wanted to share this, this quote with you from our client, Abu Qar Hassan, uh, Hassan Ahmed, who uh, just presented his testimony on damages a week and a half ago in Columbus, Ohio. Um, this is actually kind of a rare photo. They never let you take a camera into a courthouse. Um, but after, our, after we presented all of our evidence and rested and the trial was over, the deputy was kind enough to invite us to use our iPhones uh, <laughs> and take these pictures. Um, so, to, so I'm going to focus, as I said, on the Alien Tort Statute. I'm also going to focus on a couple of our Somali cases. Um, the cases that we've been pursuing in U.S. courts most recently have been Somali cases. And I, I think Shimen mentioned that there's a lot of kind of bad news, kind of depressing news coming out of these, <laughs> out of this panel or out, out of this whole struggle to have recognition for international law in U.S. courts. I want to offer a little piece of hope. We've actually won two cases within the last year. So, so also I should mention that our Somali cases, we have three cases against Somalis who have set up residents in the United States who were responsible for very severe human rights violations under the Bari dictatorship. And our cases represent the first and the only so far international effort at accountability um, for things that happened under that government. So I think it's important work in that sense that we have brought cases against people from Bosnia, Chile, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Indonesia, Peru, um, all with success, though it's painstaking and takes a very long time. All right, so within the United States, as I said, I'm gonna focus on civil cases and Naomi will talk with you a little bit about um, prosecution and maybe removal in relation to that. Yeah, she's saying yes. Um, <laughs> Because our work involves um, a lot of work with um, things that happened overseas, we obviously have to engage the U.S. government in various ways. So 
I wanted to make that visible for you. There are all kinds of limitations and issues with um, going purely with the removal process or relying on prosecutors in the United States to pursue human rights goals. I'm sure you're familiar with that in every field that there is. Um, but anyway, so we'll talk about civil suits. So this is the Alien Tort Statute that was passed, adopted by the Congress in 1789. It was part of the original legislation. You know, I don't know, I'll remind you if you don't remember that in the U.S. Constitution, there's only one court provided for. That's the U.S. Supreme Court. In 1789, Congress uh, passed legislation that created our circuit court system, our district court system. This was part of that legislation. It's, I think it's been changed a little bit since then, but in substance, it hasn't changed at all. Um, and normally it looks a little bit um, strange to translate, but I think with lawyers you know, for example, what a tort is. Um, so this essentially says that a, a foreigner who suffered a personal injury in violation of customary international law or a treaty can go to federal court. Now the treaty clause is dead, so I, one of the things that uh, you've heard from other speakers is that in the United States, treaties are not considered to be self-executing, which means that you can't bring a cause of action based on a treaty. You have to have enabling legislation. This doesn't count. Um, the courts have well decided that a long time ago. So we don't get to bring claims under treaties, but treaties nonetheless can help inform what we think customary international law is. So when, uh, when Jamil asked yesterday, you know, who's used the ICCPR in their work, everybody at our table kind of went, eh, kind of, you know, we, we have, but we can't appeal to it directly. We have to appeal to it indirectly. So, what else do I want? Oh, and the Torture Victim Protection Act, I should say. The, the ATS is, I think, the core of our work, and it's the most interesting from a legal perspective because you're trying to figure out how to um, craft federal common law causes of action on the basis of international customary, customary international law. And what that, what that means is not that you just go and find a customary international law violation. You have to find one that, according to the Supreme Court in Sosa versus Alvarez Machain, it has to be sp um, specific, universal, and obligatory. So it's, you can get, I actually would disagree with you how you represented subject matter jurisdiction, but I'm kind of still working on this. But I would say that you get subject matter jurisdiction under the alien tort statute by alleging that you have an alien with, um, who was injured, by a customary international law violation. And then after a, having established subject matter jurisdiction, it's up to the court to decide whether or not that law violation, if it is a law violation, is sufficiently specific, universal, and obligatory that the courts will then create a federal common law cause of action. That may sound like a distinction without a difference, but it will turn out to matter. All right, so 1991, Congress, um, adopted the Torture Victim Protection Act, as Shimen mentioned, um, in part as enabling legislation from the Convention Against Torture. Congress also at the same time said that they approved of the use of the Alien Tort Statute in a, a really famous case called Falartiga um, that had alleged torture and extrajudicial killing. So those are the two substantive claims under the Torture Victim Protection Act. And it's true that we feel pretty safe. All of our cases have TVPA claims, so whatever happens with Kiobel, we know that we have at least some claims. All right, so moving forward. I thought it might be useful. I'm, I'm gonna try to give you a big overview of how these cases are put together, what we need. Um, I have actually provided on your CDs more detailed handouts that you should feel free to give to your clients if you think that they might have something or if you wanna just read it for your own information. We have a lot more detail there. Um, these are handouts that we use regularly when we're doing outreach um, in diaspora communities and in home country communities, in country communities. Communities in country, there we go. Uh, <laughs> I thought it might be helpful to kind of work through a case study um, rather than to kind of talk about all of our cases. Um, and this particular case study I'm very fond of, um, the Yusuf versus Samantar case. You may have heard about it. It's been around since 2004. Um, General Samantar was the second in command under the Somali dictatorship, second to Siat Barre, and he's been living in Fairfax, Virginia since 1997. So these are our clients uh, right after they won their case but before they got their damages award. Um, and I, I'll just quickly introduce them to you. Um, let's see. This man here in the middle, 
is uh, Bashe Youssef. He's the name plaintiff on the case. Um, Bashe was arrested in 1981, tortured, subjected to a sham trial, and put in solitary confinement for seven years. Um, he was released in 1989. He was, I'm sorry, arrested because he had done things like volunteer to clean up the hospital and give money to teachers who weren't being paid, things like that. Horrible, horrible crimes against the state, right? Um, so Bashe is the lead plaintiff. He's also a U.S. citizen. Um, the two, let's see, the gentleman to his, well, I'll just point. This is Rale Mahamut. He's a goat herder from um, the similar region of Somalia, but several hours, many hours walk away, several hours drive away from the city where Bashe was taken. 1984, he and his two brothers were arrested, tortured. His two brothers were subjected to extrajudicial killing in reprisals, um, against, reprisals against civilians um, for advances of the rebel army at that time. Um, Aziz, the man with his hand in the air, um, and his sister, who's on the other side, were both, um, they both lost their father, their brother, and their cousin in the house-to-house -house, um, searches that resulted in killing thousands of people in the center of Hargeza in 1988. That was the same time when there was bombing right over the city. It was quite, um, quite a shocking event that I think we didn't hear much about in this country. Um, we didn't have access to that part of the country really very well. Um, Gulaid, who's the man in uh, sunglasses there, was a member of the Somali army who because of his clan background was, he and 63 other people were subjected to um, firing squad and part of the mass killings that went on, he just miraculously survived. Um, both uh, Mr. Mahamud and Mr. Gulaid lived in Somalia or in Somaliland, which is that northern region where the rebels actually won. By 1991, they had independence from Somalia, though they've not been recognized by any country. Um, so they traveled to the United States for their case. Bashe and Aziz are both um, U.S. citizens. And uh, Nemo lives, Nemo is Aziz's sister. She lives in uh, another country. So the legal requirements for bringing a case, I think we can all agree that these, these violations are um, sufficiently su specific, universal, and obligatory norms. You're not allowed to go and use your army to kill your own people. Um, <laughs> but um, so we have sort of the legal requirements. So the plaintiff, I, and I'll just run through these kind of quickly. I think everybody can recognize most of these. You know you need a plaintiff who will satisfy Article 3, so you need someone who's been injured. If it's the alien tort statute, they have to be an alien. So Bashe could only bring a claim under the Torture Victim Protection Act. He had no claims under the alien tort statute by virtue of having been a citizen. The other two, both, both Mr. Gulaid and Mr. Mahamud were able to bring claims on their own behalf for torture, for uh, Mr. Gulaid had an attempted extrajudicial killing claim. They both had claims for war crimes, for crimes against humanity. Um, because they were aliens, they were able to bring those additional claims. Because the law on wrongful death in Virginia requires a U.S. citizen to represent the estates, um, any estate that's involved in litigation, um, Aziz ended up being the legal representative of the four um, estates that could be brought in this case. That is uh, Mr. Mahamud's two brothers and his own father and brother. And because they, he was not the legal heir to his cousin, they couldn't bring that claim, though they could present that testimony. So you can see how it kind of shakes out. Uh, the defendant, I think for CJA, we would like to have the right defendant in our cases all the time. I think General Samantar was the right defendant in this case. There's a nice picture of him right there. It's not a current picture. <laughs> it was at the time in 1988. Um, he had full command and control of the military throughout um, the time of the Bari regime, at least until uh, roughly 1990. And uh, then it's unclear how much control he would have had then, but it didn't matter for our case. Um, he was also at one time the Prime Minister and the Minister of Defense. Um, if you are old enough, you might remember that some of the, well, actually, you may have heard about it from North Korea. One of the practices in communist countries for a time is to have these giant photos, not photos, but like paintings of uh, the leaders on all the buildings and stuff like that. Mr. Samantar was one of those guys. So everybody knew him. They learned about him in school. He's a very prominent bad guy. You've also got to show that your defendant is liable. That is, 
guilty under criminal law, liable in the US means responsible for, does that mean I have gone 15 minutes? Okay, good. I'll move forward a little bit more quickly. <laughs> jurisdiction, <laughs> you have to have subject matter and personal jurisdiction. And actually the biggest limitation on our cases in the United States, and generally, is getting personal jurisdiction on the defendants. So the fact that General Samantar lives in Virginia is one of the reasons why you sue him in Virginia. Um, there are other people who are responsible. We know where some of them are, but they're in, not always in countries where you can actually get them. So that's, that's very significant. We'll talk about subject matter jurisdiction in a moment. Um, the Torture Victim Protection Act also has a requirement of exhaustion, which is also a bit weird in this context, and it's, it's not been a big problem for our cases, but there's been one decision that suggests we're going to be maybe in trouble on exhaustion. Um, generally, that requirement is, you know, you have to do that before you can go to an international body, right? You have to exhaust your local remedies in your own country before you can say this country has not fulfilled my rights under the convention. What does it mean in these cases? Not totally clear. Maybe it means there was a prosecution or there failed to be a prosecution. Um, most of the time in the cases we bring, there's just not an available adequate remedy in the home country, so we get to bypass some of it. Timing, we have a 10-year statute of limitations on the Torture Victim Protection Act. You may have heard that there is no limitation on uh, crimes against humanity and genocide and things like that, but in US civil actions, it's a 10-year statute. Um, however, we get to toll it. You've heard of equitable tolling. So we can usually move that forward um, depending on the conditions in the country. And evidence. Um, it, in fact, I would say that one of the biggest challenges to these kind of cases is collecting sufficient evidence to really prove our cases. And one of the expertise one expertise that we have developed at CJA, I think, is, is developing the evidence in other countries in collaboration with people working um, in those countries, human rights advocates there and in the diaspora. And uh, that is probably why our work has expanded sort of organically into other countries. We don't necessarily have specialization in all the laws of the world, but we're pretty good at developing this evidence. So legal challenges, and I said I would, I would mention those. There are a couple of different legal challenges that we face. I think the most important ones and the ones that are in litigation right now in our cases are immunity and the Kiobel decision. Um, the immunity issue is the Samantar case actually went to the Supreme Court. You see Bashe and Aziz there with some of the attorneys from our office. Um, when they, when they went to the Supreme Court under whether or not individuals would be protected by the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, the Supreme Court ruled in our client's favor nine to zero that it does not. And General Samantar, though he conceded liability in court, um, nonetheless has not conceded whether or not he should be immune for all of these crimes that he's responsible for. And he is actually petitioning the Supreme Court for certiorari now. We've got it fully briefed. In the meanwhile, the United States has recognized Somalia. We had not recognized it before, so there's a whole kerfuffle. We'll see what will happen. The Department of State may get involved, the Department of Justice may get involved, or maybe, my hope, is the Supreme Court doesn't want to see this case a second time. Um, so we'll see. Um, on Kiobel, it's true. Um, I, so I, I, subject matter jurisdiction. So I, I read that decision as saying, um, it, so this presumption against extraterritoriality is a canon of statutory construction, right? So if, if you read a statute like the TVPA or a substantive statute like Title VII, you know, you read it, you say, does it apply abroad or not? It's either on or off. Title VII, it was on, so they had to revise it. TVPA, I'd say it's clearly off because it's clearly extraterritorial. So, okay, so that's it, and you're usually done. What the Supreme Court did in the Kiobel case was say, well, it's on. There is a presumption against extraterritoriality. There's a presumption against applying this statute to conduct that occurred in the territory of a foreign sovereign. But that presumption may be displaced. So this is something completely new and different. And I would, and I, I would argue, reading Roberts' majority opinion, that once the court, the court has to take subject matter jurisdiction first and decide under SOZA whether or not there's a claim that could be created under federal common law and that this displacement analysis or presumption analysis takes place as part of that cautionary analysis about whether or not to create a cause of action after jurisdiction has been established. Now you might say, well, who cares? 
<laughs> it doesn't matter. But it matters in a couple of different ways. And one way it matters is in the case I showed you at the beginning, Ahmed versus Megan, would also matter in the Samantar case. Both of those are cases that have been litigated to a conclusion, but which are still open. That is, we have a judgment, but you know, it, it's not totally, totally done. We're still waiting on a damages ruling in the Megan case, and maybe we're going to the Supreme Court or the Fourth Circuit in, um, in Samantar. We've got two appeals going simultaneously. It's the case that keeps on giving. So, <laughs> so the real question is, okay, um, are those cases done, or do they get reopened? So from that perspective, there's a clear um, possible impact. I think it also matters for corporate liability. Because if the Kiobel case set, found subject matter jurisdiction, and I think that it did, then corporations are a potential candidate. Because the Supreme Court did not decide that they weren't, but went on to the second analysis, which is, is the presumption displaced? And in that case, it wasn't. But it seems to suggest that there's some room. But we'll see. We'll see how it plays out in the courts. Um, and I think that's where I will end. I will note there are many other issues, and I would very much welcome your questions. Thank you. Oh, I missed one. There you go. Okay, so. So my role in all of this is to talk a little bit about the role of criminal and immigration, but immigration criminal-ish um, <laughs> law in dealing with human rights violators found in the US. Um, and I think that sort of on, on the kind of the theme of kind of glass half empty, glass half full, right? Um, you know, as Kiobel makes it more complicated to bring civil suits, I think that makes it more incumbent on all of us to think about, you know, what other ways are there for dealing with uh, human rights violators in the U.S.? Uh, of course, the reason why a lot of people in the U.S. turned to civil suits in the first place is because it was so difficult to bring criminal prosecutions. And the reason for that is that you have to convince a prosecutor to actually want to do this. And prosecutors have very few uh, positive incentives and a whole lot of negative incentives, right? It takes time. It takes money. There's no career boost from doing it. Uh, it's a pain in the butt. There's all kinds of difficult issues. And why do it when you can just deal with your plain old ordinary car jacking case, right? So, um, you know, that's been the main problem. And, and sort of to go back to something that Chemin said about, you know, legislation. Well, well, we now have a fair amount of legislation. The problem is getting it actually enforced in the criminal area. So what I wanted to do was to walk through a little bit what is there in the way of legislation? What can you prosecute in the US uh, as substantive crimes? And then talk a little bit about what's actually been done, which as you'll see is very, very little on the substantive crimes as such, but using the, the sort of several of the um, uh, provisions, of, especially of immigration law, to kind of hook into the substantive crimes kind of collaterally. Um, so let me start by talking about what do we have on the books. Uh, well, the first thing is the Federal Criminal Torture Statute, which is 18 U.S.C. 2340. Uh, it comes from 1984. It's part of our implementing legislation of the Convention Against Torture. Uh, and it gives U.S. courts jurisdiction over cases involving torture committed outside the U.S. where the offender is a U.S. citizen, a resident of the U.S., or present in the U.S. So it doesn't let you go anywhere in the world. But when the offender is in the U.S., uh, there is criminal jurisdiction over that person. Um, doesn't matter what their nationality is, doesn't matter where the crimes took place. Um, now, that sounds great. The only problem is there's only been one prosecution that I know of under this case, and that was the son of Charles Taylor, who was the former president of Liberia, who was actually tried and convicted by the Special Court for Sierra Leone. His son, turns out to have been a lovely character who, among other things, ran death squads. Uh, and so he was, 
picked up in the U.S. Uh, and prosecuted uh, and sentenced to 97 years in prison uh, for committing torture. Now, there's a little wrinkle on this uh, that makes it not as great a precedent as you might uh, uh, imagine, and that is that Chucky Taylor had dual nationality. So he was both a national of Liberia and a U.S. citizen. And so if you're using this as precedent to say, see, we can go after foreign violators who are present in the U.S., well, yeah, but he's kind of a U.S. citizen, so it doesn't really work that well. Um, you know, Chucky Taylor is, you know, the, the, sort of the, the only case that has gone forward. It's not for lack of trying. I mean, people have gone to the Department of Justice over and over again with, you know, dossiers on people. Um, and it's always been insufficient. It's always been, no, bring us more. No, we need more evidence. No, we've got this problem. So, no. All right, talk faster. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Genocide, uh, 18 U.S.C. 1091, uh, 2007, the Genocide Accountability Act extended jurisdiction to legal permanent residents uh, in addition to U.S. citizens and any offender brought into or found in the U.S. Uh, war crimes doesn't work. It only applies to members of the uh, U.S. Armed Forces or nationals of the U.S. A hostage taking does work if the hostage taker is president is present in the U.S. Uh, and again, that's an implementing that's implementing legislation of the International Convention on the Taking of Hostages. Uh, recruitment of child soldiers, uh, the Child Soldiers Accountability Act of 2008, 18 U.S.C. 2442, uh, punishes the recruitment of child soldiers who are defined as under the age of 15. Uh, for service in an armed force or group, uh, covers offenders found in the U.S. Uh, in February 2012, there was the first removal under this statute uh, of, a, of a librarian. Uh, a guy named George Sigby was kicked out of the U.S. for having recruited child soldiers. Uh, slavery and trafficking in persons is the other one. Um, as of 2008, uh, slavery and trafficking in persons, whether the offender is a U.S. national or present in the U.S. So now the one big gap in all of this is crimes against humanity. There have been attempts repeatedly, Senator Durbin has introduced a bill, you know, I think it's like every year, uh, to try to in, uh, include crimes against humanity in this list. So far, hasn't worked. Um, we'll see. So... <coughs> So that's what we got. And you know, it's not great, but it's not bad, right? Uh, the problem is, what do we do with it? Um, so there is in the Justice Department uh, a human rights and special prosecutions section. There's also in ICE, in the, the immigration enforcement arm, a human rights violators and war crimes uh, unit. So there are specific units in both DOJ and in Homeland Security that are supposed to be dealing with getting human rights violators out of the U.S. and or prosecuting them. Now, um, most of the action has been uh, not with the substantive crimes. Uh, DOJ has been extremely reluctant to go after people for the substantive crimes. However, there are two other ways in which they have been, both ICE and DOJ, willing to move ahead. Uh, one is removal. Um, so if someone um, came, uh, sort of, is not legally in the U.S., what they used to do is they would just put them on a plane and deport them. Right. which in most cases was the best thing for the person because they would go back to somewhere that was not going to bother them, right? And so they would be like, yes. Um, so they've now started to change that and to collaborate more with foreign security um, and prosecutorial services so that when the person gets off the plane, there's a prosecutor from the home country on the other end saying, gee, welcome home. You know, you're going to jail. Uh, so this is an improvement. Um, the other things that um, uh, 
have happened is removal after a whole sort of ATS process of the kind that Kathy's talked about. Uh, this happened with two Salvadoran generals who were um, found liable in civil suits for torture, extrajudicial killing, et cetera. Uh, they, there was then an attempt to get, um, get them Deep, sort of get their legal status removed and have them kicked out of the country as human rights violators. Um, there were removal proceedings in immigration court uh, in Florida, uh, charging them with violating section 237A4D of the Immigration and Nationality Act, which I don't expect you to remember, but I'll tell you what it says. Um, if you are an alien who outside the United States committed, ordered, incited, assisted, or otherwise participated in an act of either torture or extrajudicial killing, you are um, uh, not uh, able to stay in the US legally and can be thrown out. Um, now notice the thing that's interesting about that is the broad kinds of participation that are covered that um, include both command responsibility as well as direct participation. So it's kind of a broad spectrum. The last thing I'll say um, is that even though DOJ is not happy about prosecuting for torture, they're perfectly happy to prosecute in a few cases for visa fraud. Now here's the funny thing, right? So you come into the US and you fill out a form as a legal permanent resident and one of the questions on the form is, have you ever committed war crimes? Have you ever committed torture? Have you ever committed extrajudicial killing, right? Um, not surprisingly, most people answer no. So, <laughs> you know, right? And then if it turns out out that the answer is yes, you have committed visa fraud. Uh, visa fraud is, publish is punishable with five to 10 years in jail. And so there are now several cases um, where uh, people have been prosecuted for not the underlying torture, right, but the visa fraud. Uh, there are a uh, couple of cases involving Guatemalans uh, involved in a massacre. Um, who uh, have been picked up and convicted of visa fraud. Uh, there are other cases, there's a guy from Cape Verde who was given 36 months in jail for visa fraud and then, th then kicked back to, kick to Cape Verde where the police were looking for him. Uh, there's a case uh, now against a Salvadoran high-ranking military guy uh, involved in the Jesuit killings among other things who um, is in the process of being uh, tried and has, he entered a plea agreement. He's now now saying he doesn't want the plea agreement, who knows? But anyway, he's being prosecuted for visa fraud. Um, and so what I'll leave you with is the question, is this the Al Capone strategy where you, know, you get him on tax evasion and who cares, right? Um, or is it you know, sort of a disgrace because the US should be going after these as, under, as the underlying crimes and not trivializing what these people did as simply a question of, well, you didn't fill out the form right. So that's what I'll leave you with. Thank you. So how many people, I move around a lot, that's why I'm grabbing the mic. So, how many people have done some immigration law or have some exposure to immigration law? Okay, good. Um, and, and one thing, I think that Naomi did a nice segue between this topic and immigration, but if you needed another segue, if you've been following the whole Edward Snowden re revelation of the, S of the NSA, you know, call it what you want to call it, I can't come up with an appropriate adjective, but, you know, I think a lot of us have been getting calls who do refugee law about you know, can he apply for asylum? Would he qualify? And this interesting sort of intersection between, um, you know, is he, can he be extradited for committing a crime or is he facing perse political persecution in the US because he was a whistle, you know, whistleblower? So there's a lot of crossovers and interesting connections um, between immigration, refugee law, human rights law. So what I'm gonna try to do is um, not be overly negative about how much impact international law can have on refugee law, but I'm gonna try to talk about where there are the most possibilities. So, um, you know, you've heard a lot about treaties and the implementation of treaties, so we're gonna be dealing with um, three different treaties very quickly, 
in my presentation because I know we're running a little late, but uh, two that are up here that are the treaties that deal with refugees, the 1951 convention and its 1967 protocol. And later we're gonna talk a little bit about the convention against torture because all of those are the international treaties that provide some basis for protection for people in the US. Um, the 51 convention, just quickly, it was um, acceded, or it was, you know, came into being after World War II, and so it limited itself, its coverage to Europe, to events in Europe before 1951, and that's why there's a 67 protocol to recognize that there's a whole lot of other refugees being created by human rights violations around the world, um, that World War II wasn't the end of the production of refugees, unfortunately. And we have this definition of um, a refugee is an individual with a well-founded fear of persecution on account of one of these five grounds. And then we have Article 33, which prohibits states from returning refugees to countries of persecution. And that's what those of you who are international law um, mavens, no, uh, aficionados, or whatever the right word, early in the morning for me still, um, knows the right of... <laughs> Right of non refoulement right, which is a, a, a norm of customary international law that's recognized as Juice Kogan, Kogan's norm. Okay, so we have these two treaties. They have been implemented in U.S. law. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But before we get to that, the, the U.N. body that really has responsibility for overseeing how states carry out their obligations, state parties, is the U.N. High Commission for Refugees. It has a ton of guidance, which here's just a couple that are... Um, listed up here in the form of a handbook, guidelines, executive committee conclusions. Um, they also submit amicus briefs. Um, they also, in some countries, are asked to help with the adjudication of claims. So they, and, and in a little bit, we'll get to what the U.S. thinks of UNHCR and its opinion. So here we go. Um, in 1987, which some of us call sort of the high, high water mark in respecting international norms in the refugee area, we had this Supreme Court case, INSV Cardoza-Fonseca, that said that the UNHCR is a significant source of interpretive guidance, although it's not binding. Now, that may sound really wishy-washy to you, like, am I standing up here enthusiastic about that? And the answer is yes, because subsequently, in other cases, they've really more affirmatively thumbed their nose at UNHCR in, air, in cases that we'll get to in a, in a moment. But um, that was actually um, a, a positive statement that people to this day, you will see that, that little language um, being quoted. Okay, U.S. is a party to 67 Refugee pr Protocol, not the convention. And you heard a lot about, you know, treaties don't in the U.S. create rights in and of themselves, but you need implementing legislation. Congress enacted the 1980 Refugee Act to bring, it in, bring the U.S. into compliance with the Refugee Protocol. And there is wonderful legislative history that actually says we are enacting this legislation to bring ourselves into compliance with our obligations under the protocol. And that gets cited a whole lot too in briefs. Okay, so the implementation of treaty obligations in US law under the, um, the, the protocol, two forms of relief for those fleeing persecution um, under these sections of the Immigration and Nationality Act, asylum, discretionary form of relief for people who meet the well-founded fear standard, um, what's called restriction on removal or withholding for somebody who can show their life or freedom would be threatened. Let me point out that having these two standards, these two forms of relief with these two standards makes the U.S. the only country that actually um, has it this way, inconsistent with international norms, in that non refoulement under international understanding only should require a well-founded fear and we require a higher standard for non refoulement So just, I'm just kind of, you know, in, in the interest of time here, not to belabor the point that we, in the way in which we um, uh, legislated and the, the um, you know, standards that burden of proof that we put, we were already sort of out of, um, out of sync. Okay, so here's um, some issues that come up that raise international law issues. <clears throat> For somebody to take advantage of the, the right to get protection, you know, they have to get to the country of protection. And I can see I have five minutes left. I'll share that all with you. Uh, oh, no, I don't have five. Okay. I've gone five minutes. Okay. I'm a fast talker. Okay. Um, 
So you have to get to the country. Now, that's nothing unique to the US that there is no visa for asylum seekers, right? So this is, the, this is really the, um, what do I want to say? I can't think of the right metaphor. Maybe like the cruel promise of, a, of, a, of asylum protection of, of countries around the world that are parties to the Refugee Convention or Protocol. Gee, if you get to our country, you can apply for protection. But we don't really have any means, you know, easily where you could have a visa and come. So this um, is, you know, in, in the U.S., right, the different ways in which people come to the U.S. to seek protection. Maybe they can try to come in as a tourist or a student. But most people fleeing persecution don't really have... Um, the qualifications that you would need to show to enter legally. So for that reason, many people fleeing persecution try to enter um, without legal permission, right? And crossing land borders, entering what the term of art, entering without inspection, arriving by boat, famously sort of the treatment of the Haitian boat people, which I'll get to in a moment, um, or using false documents to, boor to board flights um, headed to the US. That's a situation around the world. But how the U.S. actually chose to deal with not just that there wasn't access to the territory, but what the U.S. did um, after the first coup against John Bertrand Aristide, um, Haiti's um, democratically elected, first democratically elected president, with a coup in 1991 and another coup in 2004, if I'm getting my dates right, against him, is, you know, desperate Haitians were attempting to flee and make it to the U.S. in boats. And um, the, the, you know, the Bush administration, and this was continued by the Clinton administration, sent the Coast Guard, Coast Guard out on the high seas to pick up fleeing Haitians and without any opportunity whatsoever to show that they had a fear of persecution, just brought them back and returned them to um, Haiti. And so this is a classic example of Ray Fumant, right? If you remember earlier talking about sort of the, you know, Deuce Kogan's norm of non-Ray Fumant, the U.S. basically implemented, implemented it, defended it. Um, U.S. Supreme Court upheld it in the Sale case in 1993, even though UNHCR, you know, said <clears throat> that it clearly violated the convention and the protocol. Um, people argued that, you know, international law norms, it wasn't that it wasn't argued, but this is an example. Now, again, I'm going to give a couple examples in a moment later that are a little bit more encouraging, but I'm sort of, you know, pointing out the areas where international law hasn't been um, a great uh, source of persuasive um, argument. Okay. So, um, this is just a little for your information sort of here that that there have been challenges in the Inter-American Commission of US policy of interdicting um, Haitian asylum seekers. And the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has said that this is a violation. Um, I, you know, it's a complicated issue. I, I probably don't have time to go into it, but to say that the US will say now that it actually does not go out and do to people what it did to the Haitians. So its stated policy is, that it no longer sort of um, interdicts people and returns them without a chance. In practice, that actually does continue, but I think these are some of the, you know, to the degree that you want to take some heart from the, um, you know, the shaming, naming and shaming that comes out of raising international human rights violations, um, the U.S. would say that it doesn't engage in the practices now that it, that it, um, that it inflicted on the Haitians. Okay. So now I'm going to get into an area where that's a little bit more encouraging, where some areas in in refugee law where um, where international norms um, can be persuasive in that, and you heard this from my co-panelists, my colleagues here, that often in, you know international norms come into play most effectively, arguing how they should inform the interpretation of certain statutory um, terms. So, and that I think is an area that's probably a lot more um, helpful. So the refugee definition, if you remember that well-founded fear of persecution on account of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group, this is where um, a good advocate can look at international norms and standards and try to argue on, you know, on behalf of your um, client in individual cases. So what is persecution? You have somebody fleeing um, 
persecution. And believe me, I got um, a couple of calls around the, the um, Edward Snowden case of was <clears throat> could he meet the refugee definition and what is persecution and whatever the U.S. wants to do to him, is it persecution, et cetera, et cetera. So there is no universally agreed upon definition of persecution, but the UNHCR and international scholars look to human rights norms, and there's this great language that persecution can be seen as a sustained or systematic denial of core human rights. So that brings core human rights into this equation that you really can argue to courts in a persuasive way. And you know these are instruments that all of you have, have some familiarity with. This is not an exclusive list. There are more international, you know, key international documents that you could um, invoke to argue that a certain thing that your client um, faces should be recognized as persecution. So, for instance, believe it or not, um, there is no published decision in the refugee area that says that forced marriage is persecution. Um, we just actually submitted an amicus brief to the Ninth Circuit, if I'm getting my circuits right. I'm looking at Blaine, who is our uh, lead, very effective brief on that, um, who wrote that brief. And so we, it, that brief is really just full of citations to international standards on forced marriage and the right to consent freely to marriage, et cetera, et cetera. Shouldn't be, you know, it's one of those things like you shake your head and you say, really? There's no published decision on that, really? Um, rape in both conflict and non-conflict situations. And again, believe it or not, I had a colleague call me in Washington, D.C., who told me he was filing an appeal um, in, a, in, an, in an asylum case where the immigration judge had um, declined to find that rape was the, you know, the, a type of harm that would rise to the level or be, you know, meet the definition of um, persecution. So again, you can look to international norms. Um, gender or sexual orientation discrimination. So there's this whole debate over, you know, or there's this you know, thing that gets thrown out blithely as if it's a legal principle. Um, discrimination is not persecution. Well, sometimes discrimination is persecution, right? If you look at sort of gen, you know, apartheid in South Africa, sort of limiting educational employment, you know, opportunities to travel, et cetera, you could say that's discrimination, that's persecution. So there's, um, you know, good norms that you could look at about discrimination, about what are, what are rights that individuals have and do limits on these aspect of their rights, um, you know, constitute this sort of systemic and sustained violation of their um, core rights. Okay, there's been, um, and I'm looking at my clock, I think I have about five minutes left here. Um, there's been less success with other key terms in the refugee definition. So, you know, again, you know, that well-founded fear, my little mantra here, well-founded fear of persecution on account of these five grounds. So with what is persecution, there are some good arguments to be made. There's this whole debate, though, about what does on account of mean? What does it mean to say that somebody is persecuted for their race? And believe it or not, for instance, let me give you an example, because you might, if you're not really familiar with this area of law, you might sort of say, what is she talking about? So you know, literally, I have read decisions where um, somebody, the, the client, the asylum seeker, was tortured while they were being interrogated. And the adjudicator said, well, you weren't tortured i.e. persecuted on account of your race, religion, nationality, political opinion, blah, blah, blah. They didn't even care what your political opinion is. They tortured you to get information, not to harm you on account of one of the five grounds. So how you interpret on account of becomes really significant. And there's an international debate about this. And the US takes the most restrictive approach um, arguing that you need proof of the persecutor's motivation. UNHCR, an international approach, is more broadly protective. It's more like a but for. You know, but for this trait, you, this wouldn't have happened to you. Um, and so this is one area where, you know, there's a lot of advocacy going on. There's a lot of ways. It, it, was, a, it was a US Supreme Court case that set this restrictive approach, so you can't just sort of you know, change that, but we're, there's a lot of creative ways through statutes and, and regulations now to try to get at that. And again, in the interest of time, I will um, not go through those fine points that are probably not of interest to more than maybe one or two people in the room, so. Okay, um, 
Other areas were, you know, very, very significant to asylum law, but less success arguing international. What's a particular social group? This is the ground in the definition. You know, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, pretty well defined, right? But particular social group is the ground that can really evolve and provide protection to, you know, groups of persecuted groups of individuals. As, as you know, we move forward, we all know that, um, you know, many situations uh, unfortunately give rise to the targeting of different individuals of different types, types of characteristics and particular social group is the ground of the definition that could provide a basis for those people to qualify for asylum. You know, there's this whole debate about are people who are um, going to be drastically affected by climate change, are they refugees, right? And people have been looking at particular social group as a, as a basis. Um, other areas that really come within the particular social group then the, and the interpretation really affects them is, is women, children, and lately with the proliferation of gang activity in um, Mexico and Central America, um, young people who are fl you know, fleeing the gangs, there's a whole debate over what social group means. People who are victims of trafficking for sexual exploitation. U.S. law has taken an approach in conflict with UNHCR and other state parties. I won't go into the details of it, um, but that's an area where you know, I think a lot of us have not given up and have sort of said, well, that's the U.S., but really want to see if through, you know, sustained efforts, we can, again, through, you know, whether it's in the courts, in litigation, or Congress, or regulations, to bring the U.S. back to um, international standards on that. Then just quickly here, um, there are a lot of bars to asylum and withholding where even if you meet the standard of a well-founded fear or a threat to your life or freedom, you can be barred from protection and our bars are inconsistent with um, international norms. We require asylum seekers to apply within a year of arriving, which for people who are traumatized, who don't have access to lawyers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it's a preposterous requirement. Um, overly restrictive interpretations of particularly serious crime, so that somebody who maybe forged a check, um, who faces certain persecution upon return, can be barred from protection, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna I'm gonna zip along in my remaining two minutes because I want to get to the Convention Against Torture, at least just um, touch on it very, very briefly. So we've been talking about the, ref the 1951 Refugee Convention, its 1967 protocol, and these forms of relief of asylum and withholding. But the third treaty that I mentioned at the very beginning that's relevant and that you've heard about a lot um, today is the Convention Against Torture, which the US, um, to which the U.S. is a party. Um, and the implementation and the requirement in this Foreign Affairs Reform Restructuring Act um, for the immigration authorities to issue implementing regulations in terms of providing protection to people who fear torture upon return of their home countries. Um, they have to show that it's more likely than not they'll be t tortured if they're returned. Um, this is where, again, you can argue international authority on what constitutes torture, but U.S. regulations and jurisprudence have narrowed the definition. And returning to... Um, Haiti as an example again, because I always think that, you know, the, the Haitians have really been the targets of so much, um, I think, calculated, intentional sort of application of the law in a narrow way, you know, the, non, the sort of, you know, interdiction and the non-torture. And these cases really, uh, there are a whole series of cases arguing that, um, that Haitians who were, repatriated to Haiti would be in conditions in detention that were absolutely inhumane um, and could lead to their you know, great suffering and death. But because the US law requires specific rather than general intent on the part of the persecutors, and the argument is, well, you know, the Haitian jailers don't intend to have their poor um, inmates suffer these torturous conditions. It's just because Haiti is a poor country and therefore, even though these conditions are pretty egregious, um, it's not uh, torture. Now, I don't, there are cases that can prevail where an individual in a condition, in a, in a case involving prison conditions can show something else about themselves or some other animus towards them that would lead to conditions that would be recognized as torture. But I just give this as an example of sort of this, 
um, this sp specific versus general intent. And I've actually seen it raised in cases where the, you know, the alleged um, torture is rape of a woman, and the argument is, well, there was no intent to make her, you know, to 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 um, make her suffer, to torture her, right? It, it's, uh, you know, really, I know I said I was going to be a little bit upbeat about using international law, <laughs> but okay. So here's my upbeat slide, my next to last slide. <laughs> so, sorry, guys. So anyway, even with all those caveats, there are people who can't be granted under the Refugee Act um, because of the, you know, the, the way on account of is interpreted. So that example I gave you earlier of a person who might, who might have been tortured, and it's, oh, you weren't tortured on account of your political opinion, but if they could show they'd be tortured if they're returned, they could re prevail under CAT because CAT doesn't require this on account of showing. Um, and also all those very draconian bars to protection under the Refugee Act apply in a more limited way to the Convention Against Torture. And then my very last slide is just my wonderful team at the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies. We really provide um, expert consultation on all of these kinds of cases, and we do a lot of um, impact litigation and policy work and policy advocacy to try to infuse our system with more international norms. So thank you very much. Thank you so much again, Chimen, Kathy, Naomi, and Karen. Um, that was, I know, a, a kind of a fast and dirty um, <laughs> overview of a lot of different <laughs> topics. Um, but we now have about 10 minutes for questions. So I'd ask um, if you have a question, if you could use either one of um, the microphones um, or uh, if you're feeling particularly sedentary, I can <laughs> bring you the microphone. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, I'm wondering, actually, in the interest of time, if other people have thoughts or comments, maybe we should get all of them first, and then we can each sort of go down the table and, and address a range of them. So, yeah, Camille. Uh, thank you so much for uh, Thank you so much for a great panel. Uh, if you could elaborate more, um, uh, maybe Shimen, on, on indirect, uh, uh, you know, how to indirectly invoke and use international law, particularly for lawyers who had no experience of using, uh, for example, in amicus briefs, uh, maybe say a few words about, you know, the Justice Kennedy's, you know, decisions and how they are, you know, have the potential of using them both, uh, you know, in lower uh, circuits, lower courts, as well as the Supreme Court. And I'll just toss one in here because I think possibly it might be useful as an example. If um, I've been really curious to know whether what, what's been going on with efforts to hold the Oakland Police Department accountable under international law. And I know that there have been there's been some stuff in the Department of Status on Women issued something a couple years ago, but um, the fact that they're under court decree uh, and it's gone on for so long and they haven't seemed to be able to, to meet the expectations of that decree, um, how one might use the kinds of tools you're you've been talking about and were discussed yesterday to address that or whether we're nowhere near exhaustion. I just have a very short question. I was wondering um, if, Karen, if you could give some examples of how CAT has actually been used um, in place of the Refugee Act. If there are specific cases that have actually gone up or is that just um, something that's yet to be tested before the courts? Uh, my question is for anyone who's maybe done work on lobbying or figuring out how to get Congress, which doesn't seem to want to do very much, to actually create statutes that would allow us to litigate more effectively, especially after Keel Bell. Um, so if anyone has any insight into how we get Congress to actually 
implement these norms in some meaningful and justiciable way, that would be great. Um, all right, so uh, I'll just take a couple of minutes and then give my co-panelists obviously a chance, um, focusing mostly on that sort of indirect invocation. So as, as Jamil mentioned, um, you know, amicus briefs, I think, are, uh, a, a, you know, a tool that can be used in moderation. <laughs> um, of course, it, it's particularly at the Supreme Court level, sometimes if you guys, you'll, you know, log on to the lists of briefs filed in various Supreme Court cases, I think there's a um, maybe a point of diminishing returns where you've got so many that you wonder if they're even read. But um, as you know, both uh, Kathy and, and uh, Karen mentioned, you know, feel free to reach out to folks like us who work on these issues because um, there may well be an international law angle that that you can um, muster in support of your position. I think that um, as became clear maybe during the course of this panel, um, in particular, if you're trying to use international law to illuminate domestic law provisions, right? You can think about at least. Two two ways in which that might happen. Um, number one, to illuminate um, US constitutional law provisions, uh, and number two, to illuminate the meaning, as Karen mentioned, of statutory provisions. Um, on the constitutional law front, that has been obviously an area of great controversy. Um, I have a little issue brief uh, that I wrote a number of years ago for the American Constitution Society that at least up till that point recapped um, areas in which the US Supreme Court had cited um, international and foreign precedents favorably, and also the backlash against that. So I you're welcome to find that brief online if you're interested in just a catalog of, of instances. Um, but there again, as I mentioned earlier, and I think this goes to the first question, you know, there's, there's a fine line to be trodden. I think the idea is to sort of domesticate the international, essentially, right, to show threads of commonality. So it's not a question of sort of the U.S. Um, forfeiting our sovereignty to the, you know, international community, but rather showing the extent to which we are very much a part of that. And, and I think that that's reflected in the fact, of course, that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, that you know came out of um, World War II was very much informed by the models of the French and American <laughs> rights declarations of the 18th century, right? So to try to emphasize the continuities rather than the disjunctions. Um, there's also the specific canon of construction, the Charming Betsy canon, right? Named after a, um, a, a boat case, a case involving a boat called the Charming Betsy. The idea is that, that US statutes, as Karen mentioned, do trump international law, right? So if Congress has explicitly chosen a standard that deviates from a, an international law standard, unfortunately, that's what we're stuck with in US courts. However, um, where there is room for uh, interpretation, there is a canon of construction that says US statutes will be interpreted where possible as consistent with international law. And that is certainly something um, to keep in mind. And, and that can be an argument that can be deployed both in, in the main briefs and in, and in amicus arguments. All right, well, I, I think I can speak to a couple of different questions, um, not certainly not to all of them, um, but the, the first was about how we, we might engage uh, the political branches, judges and juries on international cases. I think Naomi may have a thing or two to say about that also. Um, but I think the first place, so CJA, we're litigators. So the first place that we have to um, try to make inroads is with judges. And I think it's, it's been observed, I think Shaman may have observed it, but perhaps others, that judges are very reluctant, um, by and large, um, to engage in what looks like international legal analysis or what looks like potentially interfering with the role of the so-called political branches. That is, you know, the executive has the right to conduct foreign policy. And judges, if they are w often worry that they're going to get into trouble or cause some kind of problem, um, much of what informed the Kiobel decision reflects that same kind of concern. So that's, that's something that we obviously have to deal with um, early on in most of our cases. Many of our cases are delayed for years while courts are waiting on the Department of State to tell them what to do. Um, they're most comfortable if the Department of State will tell them what to do. So <laughs> um, we've, we've dealt with that for some time. So then you're talking about talking to the Department of State and sometimes the Department of Justice um, you're often also talking about or talking with um, government actors in the home country. So, for instance, in some of our, our Peruvian cases, the government of Peru waived immunity and said, "Go, please go ahead and go after these guys. Um, in the Somalia cases, because there was, up until a minute ago, no recognized government of Somalia as far as the U.S. was concerned. We were, there were two competing governments. Um, they're trans not really competing, sort of competing. The transitional federal government in Mogadishu and the Somaliland government in the north. Um, 
we ended up with dueling letters going to the courts in the Samantar case, one from Somaliland saying, please let this go forward, one from the TFG <coughs> saying, please don't let this go forward. And finally, what was really the dec decision point was the, the Department of State saying, we think the case should go forward. And so that's like the most useful, best case scenario um, for us is if the Department of State will rule in on our favor. Um, traditionally, the Department of Justice is more reluctant to allow those things to go forward. So there's, there's a sort of traditional tension there. Um, but we hope that we'll just move forward uh, more positively as we, we gain, as the courts gain confidence. And maybe the Kiobel decision will be helpful ultimately in that way. We'll see. Um, to speak to the question about Congress and what to do about legislation post Kiobel, um, I think the position of most people who are litigating these cases on behalf of plaintiffs is that Congress should please stay away from that until we know what the Kiobel decision really means. Um, there's, it's, it's such a vague decision. What we know for sure is not allowed are the facts under Kiobel. Everything else may be okay. It's, it's really hard to tell. Um, in that case, the, you know, the, it was a corporate case where they said, you know, the, the actual bad actor, um, or the, I'm sorry, the defendant was this, this transnational corporation, right? But the, the bad actor that was alleged in the complaint had acted in Nigeria, was a subsidiary in Nigeria. You may think that Royal Dutch Petroleum is all over the United States, but that's the U.S. affiliate. Those contacts don't matter. What matters was the parent company, which is traded on the New York Stock Exchange and had an office or has an office in New York through an affiliate to advise investors on investing in the New York Stock Exchange. And the court said that's not connected enough to the United States. And the plaintiffs in that case conceded that they could have brought the case in either Holland or the UK where that company's headquartered. So we know that's not sufficiently connected to the United States to, to let the case go forward. But it, it doesn't really say a lot about the rest. And with Justice Kennedy's opinion in the middle, and we all know he's the fifth vote, saying this case doesn't tell us very much. And maybe other principles apply in other cases. And we don't really know means we don't know. So for the moment, we're just going to litigate it and see what happens. Baton passed. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so to, to pick up where she left off. Um, so the last time there was a congressional effort to try to codify the jurisprudence of the ATS, it was Dianne Feinstein, and it was a disaster. I mean, it, you know, it, it, it was basically written by Chevron. Um, and, and so, you know, so I think that for many of us kind of said, you know, well, maybe not a congressional solution here. Yeah, you may end up worse off if you do that. Um, two other things I wanted to talk about. One was your question about juries um, and, and DOJ, et cetera. The problem with DOJ, I could come up with all kinds of reasons to want to get U.S. attorneys to do these cases. Unfortunately, they can't. It's all centralized in Washington. And basically, you have to go pretty high up in DOJ to get approval to do this. So it's not like you can go talk to the USA in, in San Francisco and get them to do something. They're not going to do it. Um, so that's one problem, right? Uh, in terms of juries, one of the things, I can't remember who it was. Shemin, I think you were talking about the Chevron case, Bowoto. What was really obvious there was that the defense attorneys, what they were trying to do was to other the plaintiffs. They were trying to make the plaintiffs look like they were these crazy furners that who knows how they think, right? Um, and in Bowoto, it was successful. So in terms of thinking about how to work with juries, one of the things that's important to me is to think about how do you create a sense of identification with plaintiffs who are from different places and may have different cultures, right? How do you make that understandable to a US jury? And there's a lot of work that has to go into that. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was your question about the Oakland Police Department. A um, couple of things that occur to me. One is there have been ATS cases out there uh, against LAPD, for instance, uh, where you have a Mexican citizen who is living in LA, who has been tasered by the LAPD and suffers, you know, sort of considerable harm. And the question is, is that torture? And if it's torture, it's actionable under the ATS, right? Um, not under the TVPA, but under the ATS. Now, if the problem is extraterritoriality, that doesn't seem to be much of a problem in Oakland or LA. So that's sort of one thing that um, occurs to me that you might look at. 
Um, another is something that actually comes from work that I've done on transitional justice. There was an effort a few years ago in Cincinnati, where Cincinnati had the same problem. They had a PD that was completely out of control, really bad relationships with the local community. Um, and what they did was they tried to do a kind of restorative justice, almost kind of like Truth and Reconciliation Commission kind of thing where they put together um, people from the PD, people from the community, uh, people from the sort of larger area religious figures, all right? And they had people come and give testimony about, you know, what was their interface with the cops, right? And why wasn't it working? And come up with a set of recommendations about how to improve that interface, uh, which were then, you know, the police department had committed beforehand that they would carry them out. Right. And it ended up being a very, po yeah, right, well, there is an issue there. But at least for some period of time, it ended up being a very positive experience. So that's the other kind of thing that you might think about that, that might bring in some of the international experience, if not international law, per se. So, so very quickly on that um, focused question about the Convention Against Torture. Um, there, I mean, the way to argue international norms, there's, um, there's a lot of published decisions in, in, in individual, for, in cases of individuals seeking protection in the Convention Against Torture it, throughout the circuits. And there's some splits on some issues. The, um, none of the issues, if I'm not, if I'm correct, none of them have gone to the Supreme Court. So, I mean, my suggestion is always to make those arguments. If, you know, if you're in a circuit that hasn't decided the issue, really encourage them to decide it in a way that's consistent with international norms, even if it conflicts with other circuits. Or, you know, look for a case where maybe asking them to reconsider it or reconsider it on Bach or whatever. But, um, but it's not that there's a dearth of precedent, precedent out there, um, but, I, but I think, I don't want people to think there's no issues le left to litigate. I mean, I think there's always the opportunity to try to get a little sort of like little crack in the in the wall of of more adoption or incorporation of the international standards. 